the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. And today, well, look who's back. Back again. Guess who's back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. We've decided on your theme song, a little Eminem, yes. huh? <laughs> oh, I love Eminem. I was like, oh, I can I can tell we're almost the same age, Rebecca. When you said Eminem, I was like, okay, good. I can relate to that. I love Eminem. Yes. And yes. I'm, I'm, I'm back again, so Emma's back. You, you know, Emma, every episode that you have been on, we've been getting such fantastic feedback from the listeners, and especially the last episode that we did that was titled oh, yeah. Frenemies, Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon. I think we were both pleasantly surprised at the feedback we've been getting. Exactly. Um, and thank you to everyone who listened to it. Um, and, and and this is a, a, a discussion we can have uh, going forward with, with this because it's good to 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 just get accustomed to hearing the other side, different uh, sides of the story. I love there was a little comment. Italy is uh, Team Catherine, like that thing that I was mentioning that maybe we have to broaden our horizons when we think about the Renaissance. And Tudor England is inserted in the Renaissance, so in Europe really, and then in the world because it just during this time the world becomes um, a bigger place for the Europeans. Um, so so it's great that people have liked it. I love that people like the Spanish monarchy's perspective too. I think uh, I've been studying for this for so long and it's like, yeah, people like it. It's great. It's great. And I had a feeling that would be the case. And it's something that it, it's not talked about a lot and you don't read about it a lot in these books. I'm sure more and more um, there's a lot of people doing amazing work too nowadays, not just me, other people do. So yeah. shout out to them and everyone who is really uh, asking you questions, uh, and especially in in this um, idea of the gender studies and how women are becoming in the Renaissance are becoming so relevant. Um, something that I love is because of their role in art and their role in culture. That's what I like to study, how women have contributed to the to our history with uh, this, this um, amazing uh, role of royal women being peacemakers, really. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to talk about today, right, Rebecca? Yeah, I think having you on the show has opened up so many people's eyes to there is more history than just what the what the English history books have told us. And mm -hmm. um, I want to thank you for for being on the show and shedding um, or shining a spotlight on this part of history. That's so important for us to to see it in a more well rounded view and and today we're going to do more of that because we've kind of opened the scene with Catherine of Aragon and what her alliance mm -hmm. and um, what the Spanish monarchy's alliance with England did. And today we're going to kind of look at something very similar to that. Do you want to kind of let everybody know what we're going to be looking at today? Sure, sure. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a different glass today. I just want to show it off. <laughs> For people who are not listening, I always have a round glass that I think people like because I've gotten comments about it before. <laughs> Today I have a different one. Right. And Henry VIII is still over my shoulder looking He's at me. He's still Emma. looking at me. He's still looking at me, <laughs> judging everything I say. That's why I get so riled up sometimes in this podcast because he, he's provoking me. Um, <laughs> yes, today is going to be, um, we will we'll talk about something I find fascinating, which is, that you know, we know Catherine of Aragon as someone who came from what was starting to be Spain, um, but there's fascinating women that became before her during the Middle Ages to England or to Castile. We have to talk about Castile in this, uh, be, and we'll say why after, um, that served this alliance before her. She, uh, from her early childhood, knew that she was there to serve an alliance that was older than her. That was um, very old. And she, she, her mother had a very, very big library, Isabella of Casil. She had tales of Arthur, the tales of Arthur. She had books about the history of England, chronicles, and other manuscripts that would reference. Uh, England was, um, uh, and, and Scotland were places in, in Castile that were thought as mythical because of the tales of King Arthur and all this chivalry ideas that come from from England really so uh, in Castile highly cultured people were fascinated by uh, English culture 
uh, especially because Castile and uh, England had a strong bond, a cultural bond, uh, because of the alliances established between their their monarchs for a good reason is to serve a trade industry that was growing in the Middle Ages with commodities like wool, steel, that would go from Castile to England and back. So it was really an economic alliance that was strengthened with these um, women going from one court to the other to strengthen the alliance every generation or every time this alliance once wanted to be reactivated. So those are the women that I thought we could talk about today because, I mean, they're they're, they're very cool. I you mentioned the cultural similarities between Castile and England, and that already has blown my mind because who would think? Right, right. Who would think? I think one of the biggest challenges for me as a person who bridges between both cultures is I think people see these two cultures as very different because of the language barrier, right? Yeah, we yeah. speak Spanish and we like our Spanish and English people like their English and, and speak in English. And I think that has had a, a has brought in an idea that we're diff very different and we're not because our culture our um artistic development our the, in the things i study at least we're very similar we're very similar especially in the period we are studying because this is a period where um europe becomes a whole and it and on and, and these monarchs are really playing in the european arena we talked about this before, how Henry VIII really is one of the first English monarchs that is um, playing a big time in the in the European arena, um, becoming a powerhouse name in, throughout Europe, right? So um, I, I think it's, it's important that we understand where this comes from. It comes from a development of the economy, basically, in the late Middle Ages, and especially in the trade of things that were useful to the English from Castile and to the Castilians from England. So we have a lot of that happening. And that's why if you have a common enemy, like France can be in many times for England and Castile, you have to protect that trade because that trade is done by sea. Mm. And you have to, to go from Castile, from the north of Spain to England and France is very close. So if those that alliance and um, would protect the boats, basically, that's that's why a lot of the first ambassadors and people in charge are merchants, merchants that are already going and having lots of difficulties because of interceptions, because of many things, hostile hostile environment, right? In mm -hmm. at sea. So this is what these women really represent is strengthening those bonds. Because when Flanders becomes also, which is, let's remember, with it's uh, today's Belgium, which is very near to England, and there's close cultural and artistic connections with them too. We talked about Margaret of Austria and all those things before. But when that is connected to Castile, you have an arch there. Castile, England, um, Flanders against one common enemy, France. And France is also a recurring power. Especially in the Middle Ages, it has a big conflict with England. The Hundred Year War, we've heard about this. This is when, more or less, all this alliance between Castile and England becomes so important. It's an Atlantic alliance against France, really. If you think about it, Portugal is involved, too. This is what these women represent. And the first one, listen to this, the first one is the daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry II of England. I mean, who doesn't cool love that? that medieval power couple? <laughs> oh, who doesn't love Eleanor of Aquitaine, right? Right. Oh, she's, yeah, I, I've been fascinated. She was one of the first historical figures that, uh, as you know, brought my attention as a woman. Because I knew, I always knew, uh, and why I was always fascinated by history was when I was a little girl, uh, I used to think, I used to fight for that equality with boys and I could see it in my day was easier because I'm, you know, uh, I was brought up in, in a pretty fair society in Spain, let's say it, uh, in many aspects, no, but in the essentials, yes. But I would look back into those historical figures and see how brutal times were for women. And these women that were just like amazing, just, even though the times are horrible for women, they just rose above and, and just became these iconic figures 
that are more um, iconic than their husbands? Because I think Eleanor of Aquitaine is more iconic than Henry II of England. What do you think, Rebecca? I, you know, as a podcaster and a history enthusiast, I would say that if I were to mention I had an episode on Henry II and I have an episode on Eleanor, she's going to get way more listens than he's going to get. She is far more fascinating to listeners than he is. And I'm sure that has something to do with the fact that she's a woman and most of my uh -huh. listeners and viewers are women. But she was quite amazing, even for her time. Exactly. She reminds me a lot of the figure of Isabel of Castile. She is someone who who is very strong willed and someone who doesn't doubt to take action in a in a world of men. And I, I love Eleanor. She was um, and, and we come to an idea again when we were talking about Anne Boleyn and Catherine Aragon, we were talking about the power of a queen consort is it's it, it's determined by the by the king. Whereas Eleanor of Aquitaine, because she was Duch she she, uh, she was Duchess of Aquitaine in her own right, she had power to negotiate with Henry II too. Like Isabel of Castile, uh, when she married Ferdinand of Aragon, he became king of Castile, but she was the queen, la reina propietaria. She was the, the ruling queen. So I think these figures that rise above is because they have certain um, uh, conditions that that allow them to do this too. So it's not that the queen concerts were not as iconic or whatever. It's just they didn't have that bandwidth to do these things. Yeah. But listen to this. This is very interesting because Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry II have a daughter. She's a Plantagenet. She's named after her mom. And she goes on to marry the king of Castile, Alfonso VIII. And together they become the biggest power couple in late medieval Castile. Which so is she's amazing. mimicking her mom, really, if you think about it. Well, and when we think of the children of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, we always think of the sons, right? Right. So often uh, we don't talk about the daughters. So I'm really excited right. to kind of learn more a little bit about her today. And that's crazy because in Spain, she's such a famous, iconic figure because she was in this power couple. And not only she was... She, um, during this time, queen concerts had even more power than in the Renaissance, really. E um, Eleanor Plantagenet in Castile had more power, I believe, in many ways and respects than Catherine of Aragon ever did in England. Because she was in Castile, women had uh, the properties work differently. Women could own, could sell, could buy. And she gets a huge dowry in, in, in the way that it's cities... So she gets cities that she's the lady of. So she rules over cities. And then she gets the taxes from the ports in the north of Spain. So we're she gets the money from England. She nice. gets the, the right. But what they do instead of spending that money um in in you know big court festivals, they do have them. These guys build the most amazing female uh monastery uh in Burgos, which is the center where all that trade with England gets redistributed and, and where all the things are gathered from Castile going to the north. And they build this great big place called El Monasterio de Santa Maria la Real de las Huelgas. I know this is a very long name. <laughs> so Santa Mari Monasterio, Monastery, Santa Maria, so uh, to, to St. Mary. Uh, la Real is because it's royal, La Real de las Huelgas. So this is uh, now... Uh, me, it's it was it's um a historical site in Spain that is uh, um in the Spanish heritage so you can visit it there is a museum of tech of medieval textiles there and the the advantage of these places in Spain they're not very expensive to to go in so um this is a, a an iconic place and they were buried there and their coffins are there and the, the coat of arms of England, you can see it. So you can see a visual manifestation of that power. And listen to this. So iconic this place became, this monastery, that Edward I of England married Eleanor of Castile there before they went on to be a superpower couple in England too. Ooh. What do you think about that? Interesting. I love all these connections. So bucket list, Burgos. Burgos is where this monastery is. And not only this monastery, but Burgos uh, has 
because of all this wool tr uh, trade and all this money that was coming and all the economic growth from this alliance established with England, they have the most beautiful cathedral you will ever see in your life. It's been cleaned in the last few years. Um, and it's in this, the city's not very big, but this cathedral is in the center and it's just so beautiful. And inside, because it was built in stages, you can uh, be witness to the to the different development of the artistic styles in, in Spain from the Middle Ages to the Baroque and beyond. It's a very, truly magical place. Burgos also has that monastery. And also you can visit La Cartuja de Miraflores, which is another um, religious house where the parents of Isabella of Castile are buried. Ooh. And the tomb of her parents is in the late Gothic style. It's like a star. So, and the king and queen are laid. Um, it's um, if you think about the Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey and the tombs of Elizabeth of York and Henry the Seventh, it's in that same style, but it's much bigger, more magnificent, carved in um, in marble. It's. It looks like from, you know, Game of Thrones or something like that. It's very cool. <laughs> I think we'll have to to post a visual so people can see. And Burgos has to be in your bucket list because it's a very nice city um, in Spain. And also, if you are into prehistory, some of the first uh, findings of e humans in Europe are also in Burgos in a place in a site called Atapuerca. Which is a very important uh, site in Europe in Europe now for the uh, study of the the beginning of humankind, really, and and that development in Europe. So the arrival of humans to Europe. I feel like every time you and I talk about Spain in all of these locations, we are just solidifying the fact that we're going to do our tour one day. <laughs> well, listen to this: Burgos is just an hour and a half from my city, Santander, which is on the coast. And then we could go to Laredo, uh, whereas Catherine Varagan had to be there for a month before she went to England because, and this is what I'm saying, it's not just that France is your rival, is you have to fight the elements. When Catherine Varagan left for England in 1501, there was a great big storm and they almost died. So they had to come back to the coast of Spain, to Laredo, where her where her sister uh, she had been in 1496 with her sister and queen isabel when um juana left for flanders so this these ports were extremely important that's you know 45 minutes from where i'm from and um in this place she was there for a month and her um apothecary sent word for some medicine because she was like i'm not going back in that boat tell them i'm sick <laughs> tell them whatever you want but she was truly very sick and i think we talked about this people i think it's trauma they almost drowned so i think she was just like how so what happened in the end and this is how important the alliance with england is is henry the seventh sent his best captain to get them so castilla also needed the english boats to navigate that sea that was very very difficult too juana almost drowned too with uh, right. her husband Philip, uh, we could do a we could do an episode about poison and another one about drowning. <laughs> do you know what Juana said? It, well, um, they attributed these words to her when the Juana in 1506, before she ends up in the Tudor court of Henry the Seventh, she they're about to the, they're they're in the big great big storm and their boat is they're like I think with we're, we're sinking and she says. It's fine. I've never heard of a queen uh, drowning, so don't worry about it. We'll be fine. She was All right. right. All right. That was after her husband freaked out, right? Yeah, he freaked out. He was crying like a little, like a little boy. <laughs> he was crying like a little boy. Well, I would be crying like a little girl. So I don't blame Philip for crying. And and but Juana just had that kind of like I think is sometimes that conviction that your life is in God's hands and right. how uh, you've never I've read all these history books that my mom made me re read about. No queen ever drowned. 
Right. I mean, she, she, was she a had queen. a point. <laughs> right. <laughs> and she was right. She didn't. Nope. Nope. But then her husband did die not too long after. Her. <laughs> yeah. But that was, a, that's the poison episode, Rebecca. Right. Don't get ahead of, you, of sorry, yourself. Sorry. I can't help myself. <laughs> I'll give you a little teaser about that. So because they arrived to Castile to Burgos, we were talking about Burgos just right now. And they put on a little show. She's ruling. Juana did rule for a little bit. Um, and Philip just can't take it and he wants the whole power. And Ferdinand is like, okay, you guys are here. You're the king, queen. Uh, I'm just going to retire to Aragon because there's nothing. Um, you don't want me. Philip and, and Ferdinand did not get along whatsoever. Uh, Catherine had been warned of this, Catherine of Aragon, and had uh, a whole, basically her, um, her duena, her... Her governess betrays her because she's plotting with Philip. And when Catherine finds out, she's like, no, I'm loyal to my father. So she gets involved in that before, before Philip and Juana finally arrive to Castile, to Spain. And they meet Fernand in Burgos, the city I was just telling you about, right? Um, and then so Fernand says something like, well, okay, you guys are great. So I'm just leaving. And Philip just dies a couple of days later. <laughs> so everybody, and just very quickly, and he just gets very sick, you know, you know, right. Right. from drinking some water or <laughs> some, some very cold water. I'm like, yeah, some water with poison. Uh, so then think about the trauma for Juana, because everybody at court is saying her father has uh, poisoned her, and she's pregnant. She's pregnant and she has that baby after he has died and she names her Catalina, Catherine. Mm. Wow. Yes. Game of Thrones has nothing to do with the Trastamanas and the Tudors. <laughs> and somehow we got distracted from our topic yes. and had to get this always happens. Oh, I, <laughs> I know. Let's get back to the Plantagenets. Yeah. Which they are intense. But we were talking about Burgos and see yes. how important Burgos is. So maybe it's more a geographical episode today because Burgos <laughs> is the place where, for example, the ambassadors of Henry VII are welcomed in 1489 when the alliance is reactivated, uh, when Arthur is already born, Catherine is born, and, you know, they name her Catherine, they name him Arthur, they're like, oh, this is kind of perfect, and we'll talk about why Catherine and Arthur are perfect names too. And in Burgos is where, where they have big parties because all the merchants in Burgos are like, great. With the War of Roses, we've, we've had so many problems uh, selling our stuff in England and bringing our stuff back that this new king, this new alliance is going to bring stability to our trade. So there were great big parties uh, done in Burgos for these ambassadors. The treaty was then uh, signed in Medina del Campo. Are you guys putting these names in the bucket list? Because Medina del Campo should be there. There's a huge big castle called La Mota, and Castile is named because it's full of castles, people. Let's go. Oh, to oh yes. interesting. Oh, yes, yes. So Castile is full of castles. That's why it's called Castile. Uh, and there, the one in La Mota, the Palace of La Mota, Castle, Palace of La Mota, is amazing. And that's where the treaty was signed. But moving back to the people that we were talking first. To come to Catherine of Aragon at the end of the episode, we talked about Eleanor of Plantagenet uh, and uh, Alfonso VIII becoming king and queen of Castile, founding that monastery in Burgos, and then just uh, being very successful for two reasons. First of all, because they were in agreement and they had many children, so that helps, obviously, and their children became really relevant people. Um Queen of France, all these things. And second, because uh, they they rule together. They appear, they, they are ruling together. That's how powerful the Plantagenets are in Castile, that she's actually ruling with him. Um, and, and when you have these power couples, people like it. Like Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII were in their first years, people like mm -hmm. that a king and a queen are successful, having children, blah, 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 blah. blah. So they go on to become very important they they conquer different cities we are still at time where the iberian peninsula had different kingdoms some were muslim some were christian so the christian kings our monarchs are trying to push that what 
in Spain is called Reconquista, reconquering the land. Um, so they, for example, take the city of, of Cuenca and they build a cathedral there. So they are the founders of cathedral cities of this is this is a time where um Spain is in construction, really. Um, and they're these mono this couple specifically is very important for that. So time frame, are we still are we talking in like 12th century? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Just to just to get us in the right. Think about Eleanor. She's the daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Think yes. about it. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. But we yeah, we can jump a bit further. And and um the reason why this alliance also is really established is because of Aquitaine. Aquitaine is in, in France, but it was in France at the time, and it's an interest for the monarchs in Castile because of that war that I was telling you, the Hundred Year War, uh the map of Europe was very different. Of, to what we know now. And, we, the, and, and then the Plantagenets had an empire in, in France too. So France is also doing its thing of, I want to reconquer all my lands and become France again, or become a powerful France. So Aquitaine and Guyenne and these places that are on the Atlantic coast of France are always contentious for these monarchs in Spain and Castile and, and England. So this is another reason why, again, on the coastal side, because yeah. of that trade, right? Right, coastal so the, communities. Yeah. So the following uh, important woman for this alliance is another Eleanor. Eleanor of Castile, who I said was married to Edward I in Burgos, in the monastery <laughs> of Burgos. But she's very important too because she is the half-sister of the most famous important monarch in medieval history in Castile. Alfonso X, dubbed mm. the Wise. Have you ever heard of this monarch? I don't think I have. Oh, Alfonso X is amazing. He's known for his patronage of the arts, of the humanities. Uh, there was a, a cultural, artistic revolution during this time, and he's dubbed the Wise. Um, so he was a very powerful monarch in Castile, and there's a lot of studies that have been done about him and his time. Um and he was just, a, is also a very iconic figure. And he is also uh, ambitious. So he has a half sister that uh, he wants to marry to the king of of, uh, of England because of thinking again, think about Isabella and Ferdinand. They're not the first ones to want to expand in Europe. Uh, the Castilian monarchs were looking beyond um, always. That's why Isabella marries Ferdinand of Aragon because that gives her the access to Europe too, doesn't it? Yeah. Think about it. Uh, and then Aragon is enemies with France too. So this is a perfect and has a growing empire in the Mediterranean. So this is the Southern kingdoms in Europe really pushing North uh, because they're becoming powerful with, especially exploration with, you know, like the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Castilians are, navigating not only to England, but also now to Africa. They've gone all the way to India and more and more thinking about what's beyond this, uh, what's beyond Finisterre. There's a place in Spain called Finisterre, so the end of the land, because at the time they thought it was the end of the land until Columbus went, right? And they realized, well, there was something else uh, beyond uh, that Finisterre. So, but going back to Alfonso X, he is a king that is looking beyond Castile and he wants international alliances. And that's why he marries his uh, half sister to, the, to Edward. And it, uh, Eleanor of Castile changes everything in England. She really is the one to establish the dower of the, the lands of the Queen's lands that all the later Queen consorts would inherit. Oh. She's the one to buy a lot of land. She buys Leeds Castle, for example, a, a castle that would become later I iconic because it is such a beautiful place. She was the one, she wasn't popular though. Uh, she, because she was powerful and she was foreign. So mm -hmm. she did bring her foreign relatives into the mix and she had lots of uh uh, contact with Jews, and that was something that in England was starting to be a problem. Um, and Edward finally is the one 
to expose the, the Jews from England in, in 1291. Uh, and so... It's she's she's the one who really gives the figure of the queen consort the power with lands, with uh, just by her queenship, what the queenship she develops. She's also has a uh, uh, she's also a very iconic figure because when she dies, he builds twelve crosses to her memory. That are from the place where she dies uh, till till um, Westminster Abbey, and those are known as the Eleanor Crosses. So some of them still survive. So we'll have to take a flight when we do a tour <laughs> from Santander to London to continue the tour. Uh, we're not we're not that far away, <laughs> right? Right? It's no, not that far. <laughs> no, I've done that. I've taken that flight two hundred times in my life since I was five years old. So it's not a problem. Um, yeah. So that that's how important, really, that alliance is with every with the next woman. Something new comes that establishes something new. Yeah. If you are interested in the figure of Eleanor of Castile, this is one of my favorite books of all time. This is why I'm going to recommend today a book. Um, John Carmi Parsons wrote a book called Eleanor of Castile, Queen and Society in the 13th Century England. That is out of this world. It's it's a dense academic book, okay? Uh, but it's so good. Anyone who wants to uh, start thinking about queenship and what that entails, this is your book. Uh, even Renaissance queenship, because this is when that Renaissance queenship is established, because Eleanor really gives them the means to be able to exercise patronage, right? Lands, revenues, all those things are needed if you're going to have power especially when the king has all the power right so she's yeah. giving the queen power eleanor I, of you know, amazing I, i'm blown away that she established the dower properties and well they were there sort of but she buys so much more and she puts it under the name of the queen so then edward when he marries again he gives that to his next queen that's what she does she yeah she she gains a lot of power um, that she through those lands that she purchases that and and I think this is because she had seen what in Castile that could do for a queen consort, right? Yeah. Because in Castile, and this is something very important that influences England deeply, is in Castile women had a different um, a different status towards the law. They were uh, they they had independence. They could own property. They could write a will. Even the, when they were married, their property was still theirs. So if your husband wanted to divorce you, for example, you would keep your own stuff. That's how it was. Pretty much like nowadays, right? In, in many ways, right. in respects. That is key and crucial for a woman's life, for her chance to be independent from her husband. Financial independence, really. Right. And we're talking about these women that have a, come from families. And also it gives, when the families realize this worked well, they were like, we are powerhouses now because you have double trouble. You have the men and the women that can, that can inherit. And therefore, I mean, a lot of men die. And a lot of the times people have girls. And to give these women the opportunity, that they don't have the same status as men. But yes, they can become links that unify those houses. That's why in Spain we have the grandees, those those houses that get to be so powerful, is because they are including the women. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the dynasties that die out in France or in England it's because they don't have men to to continue it, them. So this this strategy of Castile that then becomes a strategy of the Spanish monarchy is very efficient in terms of and i mean it basically is the reason why mary tudor becomes the first queen regnant if you think about it in it many respects all comes back to the tudors it all comes back to the tudors <laughs> well we are in the 13th century with eleanor of uh yes still she dies in 1290 that's when uh and then she has a beautiful 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 tomb in westminster abbey it's a beautiful, uh, you have to go and see it. You can't actually see it very well because it's up top. But if you Google the image, you'll see it's, it's, it, it looks like a medieval serene queen that you're like, oh, this is what medieval queenship looks like, right? 
So I think that's why she's so iconic. Um, and then Edward is devastated. Um, she was important to him. He, she was, for example, crucial to him sometimes because she brought her own uh, archers when he was in trouble. So this is why women that have that capacity can help their husbands a lot, you know, and yeah. like, like, yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's, she's a, she's a powerhouse too, an orca still. Not very liked during her lifetime. I'm imagine, afraid. imagine that. <laughs> imagine a powerful woman that nobody right. likes. I oh know. no. This seems to be a common theme that we run across, oh. doesn't it? Can you imagine working all your life towards a goal to help your first your family, your, your born family, then the family you marry into? You you do all these things and then you remembered that somebody's like, nah, she's nah. Because people are scared of this too, I think, right? Imagine a, in a place where women didn't have a voice, someone comes and says, I want to buy this castle. I want to do this and I can get those lands and you make sure they're the next to the other ones because I want to make it really big. So you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or she has, for example, she's such an iconic figure and such a bridge between Castile and, and the Iberian Peninsula really and um, in England. She has Aragonese gardeners in her gardens. She brings people from the Iberian Peninsula to tend to her gardens. So she introduces new plants, new trees, especially in that southern area of England that's not that different to the northern area of, of the Iberian Peninsula. Ooh. So there's a lot of uh, development of, and she has contact with her brother and her brother's court, which is a flourishing court. So uh, there's a lot of uh, troubadour culture that is introduced to England. Um, just she's... She's great, and this book. If if you if you want to get into knowing her, she's that. That's a book you need to read. Just a, a random question here: um, While in England, what language did they speak to each other? Right, the, the, you know, this is one of the. To, uh, Parson says that he he doubts she might have ever spoken English uh, because we have to think we're still at a time where the English court largely spoke French. And she was raised in the court of of Alfonso X, but she was uh, Countess of Ponthieu. So she, you know, the, probably they they talk they talk to each other in French. Uh, I I highly doubt that she wouldn't have learned English. I think that someone who's already learned French and knows Castilian and goes on to be a queen for a long time someplace. I I, but I don't know the the evidence. You know, the further you go back, the more difficult. I almost forgot about the most important thing about Eleanor of Castile and Edward the First. What's that? They they went to Holy Land together on the Crusades. <laughs> how did you forget that? <laughs> I was just, just so enthralled talking about how wonderful she was uh, endowing the Queen's lands that I forgot that she traveled the world too. That's amazing. How cool is that? And there's a story, and we don't know if it's true or not, but there's lots of art representations of this there's a story about um edward being bitten by a snake and it was actually uh eleanor who sucked out the poison <laughs> poison um and that's that's a story that, that was told that, that she saved his life in holy land wow well yeah. i'm i'm interested by that story when was that story written no, when was a story written um I don't know when it was written. We should check it out. But listen to this. She buys Leeds Castle, right? She goes to Holy Land and comes back and that story is written about them. Uh, and then during the time of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII, Leeds Castle is refurbished by Sir Henry Guilford for Catherine of Aragon. There's still like lover's knots with with uh, Catherine's pomegranate and uh, H's and K's in Leeds Castle. It was a, because the queen's household had become so big, he made a, hu, a new remodeling of the whole castle. To add, he, he added the maiden's tower and all these things. But listen to this. Sir Henry Guilford also went to Holy Land. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, because he was a keeper of Leeds Castle for all those years, I wonder if he... If there was something in Leeds Castle, a manuscript of, of their trip of, of uh, Eleanor and Edward, something like, think about it. These yeah. people are also 
Uh, so Henry Guilford was a humanist. He would also be interested in any historical artifacts that he would have found in that castle. And that castle must have been something really unusual to him in many respects, but something familiar. The castle, the, what is the Gloriette, the main area, is an influence from continental influence in England that was had not been built before like that. And Sir Henry Guilford fought in the War of Granada with Ferdinand of Aragon and was knighted in Burgos. And he added a pomegranate to his coat of arms. These things are all connected. So I wouldn't be surprised if it, and Sir Henry Guilford wrote a book about uh, traveling to Holy Land. Mm. I wonder if he wrote about this passage. Interesting. Yeah. You know, you have, we have a whole new project here. I, I, you have mentioned Sir Henry Guilford, I think, in almost every episode that you've been on. And I feel like he has never talked about. I rarely heard about him until you came on the show. Oh, maybe episode of Sir Henry Guilford? I know, right? I wonder if anybody would be interested in that because it sounds well, like he was quite a fascinating man. The the portrait of Sir Henry, there's a there is actual drawing and portrait by Holbein. Yes. Amazing. It is. And of his wife. Right? Yeah. The drawing was just in the in the in the exhibition in the Queen's Gallery, in the Holbein exhibition. He is a, a front man in I don't know why they don't talk about him more. He is, he's the one who is the first royal servant to hire Holbein. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. For uh um Oh, I don't want to get into this because it's so it's so good. Let's keep it for another episode. <laughs> okay, we'll keep it for a future episode. <laughs> oh well, it's 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 very good. It, it's a whole episode should be on this. But let's say that it's uh, Catherine Aragon's final final push to try and push away Francis the first. Oh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, and so Henry Guilford is part of it. And when that fails, he has a a row with Anne Boleyn, didn't he? And he ends up leaving and going to Leeds Castle, where he's probably he's because he, he doesn't want to be in court anymore. So that's probably because he's so important in the first part of the reign of Henry VIII. Those are figures sometimes that are not as well studied as right. you know the the other ones. Right. So Henry Guilford is amazing. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to make a little note about doing an episode on him in the future, <laughs> because I think now I want to go digging a little bit deeper into his life. Yeah, yeah, you like you that. like it. I, I recommend anyone, uh, we can do an episode on it. it. There's so much to him, and he was a world traveler. He was a humanist. He was a fun guy because he was the master of revels, so he knew how to throw a party. Um, and he was involved in the revolution of, and this is something I started doing when I started researching, was basically sitting parties, which is something I like a lot. <laughs> um, so sitting the festivals uh, in the court of Henry VIII in the early years, we could talk about Sir Henry Guilford's role in introducing, in introducing the carnival into England, which is something, you know, they all would dress up as um different things each year we'll talk about it in an episode it's really cool i love really that cool. you call him fun guy that's like his moniker sir henry yeah. guilford fun guy <laughs> fun guy uh master of parties who doesn't want to be friends right. with a master of parties right i, I that if i went to the to a court that's the first guy i would go up to i'd be like do you have a job for me <laughs> no i feel like i need coffee mugs and t-shirts made with his picture that says fun guy yeah yeah fun guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, party party animal. Um, but yeah, so the connections, right? I think yeah. this is what is telling us is the connection. And Sir Henry Guilford was also someone serving this Spanish alliance. So we have to think that it's not just Catherine of Aragon. It's the network that comes with the Spanish alliance. Those interests, think about the Spanish alliance comes with also the Italian merchants. The Italian mm. merchants are come into England because of the Spanish alliance, mostly. When those, uh, when when the Spanish alliance declines, different merchants come from Italy to through the French alliance. But, you know, these were tight networks and you were serving a certain king. If you were serving the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Spain, Charles V, you, and, and the alliance is ended, you take your bags and you leave and somebody else is going to take your place. But it's it's not going to be you because uh, your loyalty to your master was everything, right? So mm. 
the so Henry Guilford and a lot of people and their decline um, represents the 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 exit of the Spanish alliance and the arrival of the French alliance. That doesn't work out very well uh, because Charles V is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we talked about Eleanor Plantagenet. Mm-hmm. We've talked about Eleanor of Castile. Is there anything else that you want to touch base on her or are we ready to move on to the next ones? No, just that connection with Sir Henry Guilford, I think, is and Leeds Castle is crucial. Um, and Leeds Castle is in the tour. So we'll, we'll go there and, and talk about Sir Henry Guilford. Um, maybe we could even dress as the Tudor court. Who knows? This is all open. This is all open right now. Uh, but it. no, I the, the other three women that I want to talk about are related. And, and so we can talk about them in tandem uh, because they are the uh, direct predecessors of Catherine of, of Aragon. And this is uh, Constance of Castile, Isabella of Castile, not Catherine of Aragon's mother, I'll explain, and um, Catherine of Lancaster. Mm. So we are now in the midst of, uh, of the, all the conflicts, the dynastic conflicts in the 15th century right? Yes. We are in the inception of the War of Roses with mm-hmm. the Lancasters and the Yorks, right? So uh, in, Sp- in Castile, a very similar thing happens. The Trastamaras are having lots of trouble. In this case, because they're all married to each other, is the cousins and they're all <laughs> Trastamaras, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing because the York and the Lancasters come from the sons of the King of England, really, too. So, I right. mean, this is just like... People who are related not getting along in the 15th century, right? In yeah. Castile, that's why I'm saying Castile and England have very similar historical developments. So there's a lot of dynastic conflicts in the 15th century. So there's a even a civil war in Castile with Isabel of Castile. And we talked about that in the previous episode, but we're focusing on the previous time, which is um, when Peter I of Castile, dubbed the cruel by some, was stabbed in the back by his half brother Henry of Cast- uh, Henry of Trastamara, and Peter dies. So oh, he, he was literally stabbed in the back. Yeah, <laughs> literally assassinated <laughs> by his half brother. This is how oh good this story is. Starts right. Here we go. Here we go in Montiel. So, oops, there's a problem here, right? Because uh, Peter was the king. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so once you stab your, your, your half brother in the back and you become king, you're going to have trouble, especially mm. if you can't capture the king's family and his daughters, Constance of Castile and Isabella of Castile, go quickly flee and go to Bayonne in France into the dominions of the Duke of Lancaster, who is an ally of was an ally of Peter, uh, the king of England, Edward III. We're right now in Edward III. Right. So the daughters of the assassinated Peter of Castile marry the Duke of Lancaster, one, and the Duke of York, the other. Hmm. And they become duchesses in England. They they go to England. So this is John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, and Constance of Castile, his second wife, married and had a daughter uh, that was born in 1373, and they named her Catherine, Catherine Hmm. of Lancaster known in the English sources as Catherine of Spain because Ooh. Constance was the eldest daughter, surviving daughter of Peter I. She was a contender to the throne of her uncle, right? Right, and, right or, and his successors. So John of Gaunt uh, says, my wife is the rightful queen of Castile, so I'm the rightful king of Castile by marriage. So he uh, he makes an alliance with Portugal, with John I of Portugal. Uh, they sign a treaty called the Treaty of Windsor, which is the oldest treaty, diplomatic treaty, still in force today between two nations, England and Portugal, the Treaty of Windsor, still in force today. That's oh. the oldest standing treaty in the, in the, in the history of, of Europe. And they invade Castile through Galicia, through that region in Spain that is above Portugal on the coast, Atlantic coast. And they try to invade Castile. So what John the first of Castile, now we're all to everybody's John, John of <laughs> Portugal, John of Castile. Uh, so John of Castile is like, wait a second. I think we're going to get into trouble here. 
there's trouble in England too. The Duke of Lancaster is like not advancing a lot. So John of Castile and, and the Duke of Lancaster agree to marry their children, give them both a title of heirs, both of them, Catherine as well as as, as Henry, who is the heir, Henry and Catherine. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? And marry them. Okay, so they get married and they become princess and princess, prince and princess of Asturias. Mm. That title is a new given title to the heirs of Castile, then the heirs of the Spanish monarchy, that mimics the Prince of Wales. So it's an influence from England into Castile. And it's the title that our princess in Spain has today. She's the Princess of Asturias. Eleanor, she's called. See how <laughs> this is all connected? Yes. She's not a Trastamara. She's a Bourbon. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's it's different times, but same names, right? Basically. Right. Same title, same name. So this title is something that is an influence from England. And they become another power couple. Guess what? They do it. They become a power couple. And they have a son who is the father of Isabella of Castile, Isabella I of Castile, John II. Hmm. But Henry III, married to Catherine. Now we're on to Catherine Henry again. <laughs> uh, he dies very soon when the, when the child is only a boy. And Catherine of Lancaster rules Castile for years and years. First with her with her with her um brother-in-law, but then he is elected king of Aragon and he goes to Aragon and then she rules on her own for years. She rules an English born woman, rules Castile for years on end until her, until she dies in in fourteen eighteen. Wow. So this is how cool she is a great patron of the arts. She has a woman advisor that is the first person to write an autobiography in Spanish. I mean, wow. Catherine Lancaster is out of this world. And she's the, and that's why Catherine Aragon is named Catherine of Arag Catherine for yes. Catherine Lancaster, who ruled Castile. And she consolidates the diplomatic alliance between uh, Portugal, where her half-sister, Philippa of Lancaster, is a queen consort, very powerful one, and with her brother in England. So how cool is that? Every time we talk, I learn so many new things. You know, medieval England is is not something that I've focused on too much. The Wars of the Roses, I know enough about to be dangerous. But the whole John of Gaunt part of this story that you just told, I didn't know. I had no idea that he and his wife saw themselves as the king and queen of Castile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No idea. Yep. I, I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless right now. <laughs> this is how cool this is. And, you know, I don't know enough about, I wish I, I did an article years ago. I, I have done a course in the Instituto Cervantes. I want to thank the Instituto Cervantes London because these guys were the ones who asked me to do a course on these women that I've studied for years. And I learn every time I prepare for these things, I learn things about these fascinating women. There's so much to do still. So I encourage everyone who's fascinated. And you know what's really going to be the next big big thing, I think, in, in, this, in the study of these women is cross-cultural uh, studies. To, to go into the archives, not only in England, but also in, in Spain, and cross-reference these, these documents and collaborate with uh, historians, you know, between England and, and Spain, because our history is so connected. It's so interlinked. There's so much in the Spanish archives about England, about the War of Roses, about that I have never seen published in any book. There's chronicles. There's, there's chronicles of what happened in England during the War of Roses, during the reign of Henry VIII. Right? Right. Chronicles that have been dismissed that shouldn't be dismissed, like we talked about, because they give valuable insight from foreign eyes, too. Foreign mm. eyes like Henry's eyes, because he's still looking at me. <laughs> he's still watching. <laughs> I'm a Spanish subject, Henry. Those are foreign eyes to me. <laughs> I just love, Emma, that you come on the show and you give us this different perspective. 
that we don't hear about. And it's so important to know that there is always more than one side to the story. And, um, and, and, and you know, this comes around when, when you hear the other side of the story, your side of the story gets so much richer and you know, oh, I need to go back to that document because now that makes sense. Or, right. oh, here's a connection. How cool is that, right? Um, and I, I see a lot more collaboration now between um, scholars also in Spain and England. I hope this just increases because it's so enriching. We, it's it's really it's really good. I think we have to stand understand that if we study the Renaissance, especially, we study a global world already, uh, and we the same way you study the Venetian ambassador in the Tudor court. You should study the reports that arrived to Spain from England, right? Yes. Exactly. It's so important to look at all aspects of history to understand it as a whole. Just like if I tell you a story about something happened to me, you're only hearing my side of the story. Right. You don't know the side of the other people who've been involved in it, which then makes it a much richer story. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I trust you. I think you're you're trustworthy. So I would I would... <laughs> I would believe you, but yes, yes, because sometimes even people, you know, and and then it gets it it it's it's just like something that feeds itself, right? When you take other, uh, and you don't have to be an expert in everything. I consult with so many people. I am so grateful because most scholars, most people who are researching, are willing to help because it's dissemination of their own work because it enriches their own work too, and because we like it, we're nerds, we like it. So reach out to those people. Don't be scared of reaching out to people who are specialists in things. If you need information, if you think you have a good lead and getting out of your comfort zone when you're studying the tutors would be my other advice to people who are studying the tutors right now. Try, try, try to find things in other places. You will be surprised how many things there are, not just in Spain, in Italy, in, in other places. It's, it's um, pretty amazing. I think it's fair to say that maybe that is your takeaway for today. Right. Yes. The the Eleanor of Castile book, I will recommend this till the end of time. Uh, and also the, uh, yeah, the thinking outside of the Tudor box. How does That's, that sound? Sounds wonderful. And I know we have another episode coming up soon that um, everybody is going to love to hear about, but I'm not going to tease it today because I think that one um, we're going to just save for the release date. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, I'll be quiet. I'll try my best. <laughs> Dr. Emma, thank you so much for coming on the show today again. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone.